So just examples of some cal calculations. Gauss's law has a number of different uses, and it's one of these concepts that physicists like a lot because you get to use it to do certain types of proofs in a sort of very elegant and uh, intuitive way, or I should say a way that involves symmetry rather than just lots of brute force calculation. And you can show, use it to show some things that, um, that were kind of difficult to show without it. Uh, one thing to think about is where does this constant epsilon naught come from? Well, we, we know that the flux has something to do with the charge. How do we know it's the correct constant? Well, one way you can prove that is imagine you have just a point charge. Okay, so here's a single positive charge, charge Q. And I'm going to imagine it's at the center of an imaginary Gaussian surface, which is spherical. Okay, so this is a Gaussian sphere, sometimes it's called. So I have a charge in a closed surface. And I want to think about how to apply Gauss's law to this situation. And so we have E dot N hat dA is equal to char the charge inside divided by epsilon naught. And this is one of a very small number of situations where you can actually use Gauss's law to calculate the electric field on the surface. So in an, what it involves is doing some geometric reasoning, thinking about the symmetry of the situation and uh, thinking about how to use that to make an integral that's kind of easy to do. So let's imagine for, we already know what the answer to this question is. We already know how to figure out the electric field due to a point charge. But let's, uh, for a second, assume that we don't. All we know is that the charge is positive, and we know it makes an electric field. But you could do some reasoning about the symmetry of the situation. And you could say that, OK, I know that no matter what direction I'm looking at the charge, it looks the same, right? I can rotate the charge around in any direction I want. It looks the same to me because it's just a point. It has spherical symmetry, right? So everywhere over the surface of this sphere, the electric field has got to look the same. It's got to be pointing radially outward. So that's our electric field. And I, it has to have a uniform magnitude across uh, over the surface of that sphere, because if it didn't, if some side had a smaller magnitude than another, then it wouldn't have spherical symmetry. It would look different from different angles, and that just doesn't make any sense ba based on the symmetry of the situation. So even without doing any calculations at all, purely from the symmetry, we could reason out that the electric field has got to be uniform over the spherical surface. Uh, it's either got to point radially inward or radially outward, and we know it's positive, so it's got to point outward. Okay. Well, once we do that, then we can think about calculating the flux over any part of this sphere. And let's, again, imagine breaking the sphere up into little pieces of area delta A or dA. And so there's an electric field. And here's the little piece of surface area. And n hat is pointing what direction? To the right, OK? So there's n hat. And so what do you know about the electric field and n hat? Their directions are the same, OK? What if I looked at, say, a piece of area down at the very bottom? Same thing, right? The electric field is pointing down, and n hat's got to be perpendicular to the surface, and so it's got to be pointing in the same direction. So no matter which piece of the sphere I look at, n hat is always going to be parallel 
to the electric field. So the dot product, if I say the magnitude of E times the magnitude of N hat times the cosine of zero degrees, dA and cosine of zero is one, and the magnitude of N hat is one, so that's just going to give me the electric field magnitude times dA. But what do we just say about the magnitude of the electric field over the entire surface? It's uniform. So if this is a constant, I can bring it out of the integral. And so this boils down to an integral over a closed sphere of dA. We're just summing up all the area elements. If you just sum up all the little pieces of area over a closed sphere, what are you going to get? Surface area of a sphere. What's the surface area of a sphere? Not 4 thirds pi r cubed. That's the, that's the volume. What's the area? 4 pi r squared. Where r here is the radius of the sphere, okay, and that's the distance from the charge to the sphere because the charge is at the center. So we get the electric field times 4 pi r squared equal to the charge inside over epsilon 0. Or if I solve for the electric field, what am I going to get? Q inside over r squared times what? Times 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Look familiar? Better, <laughs> better at this point. So you, we get back the electric field of a point charge, okay? Which is essentially where the electric field of a point charge comes from in a more fundamental sense. Gauss's law is really telling us nothing different than that. Uh, it's just a more sophisticated or more elegant way of doing it. And so, had this constant been something else, it wouldn't got, it wouldn't have given us back the uh, electric field of a point charge. So we know the constant has to be epsilon zero. That's essentially where where that proof comes from, okay? So using, elect, uh, using Gauss's law in cases of very high symmetry can actually give you value of the electric field. And it actually works for point charges or spherical distributions. So for example, I could do the same thing with a, uh, a sphere of charge. If I had a uniform the charged sphere, and this is a problem that we've looked at before. In the past, we said, okay, we said that a uniformly charged sphere on the outside behaves as if it were a point charge, right? The electric field is the same. Well, where we can actually formally prove that, we could do, we could do it with a brute force sort of a calculation. We showed a demo program of this a while back where you broke the charge up into rings. But you could do the same thing with Gauss's law. And it is the exact same argument as with the point charge. If this is a uniformly charged positive sphere, and I'm drawing a Gaussian surface that is concentric with it, and I didn't quite draw it very well. Let's make it a little bit more concentric. So that this is this capital R is the radius of the sphere, and say little r is the radius of the Gaussian surface. You go through the same steps again. You say, okay, this is a very symmetric situation. I rotate the sphere, and if it's uniformly charged, no matter how I rotate it, it should look the same on all sides. So that tells me at a uniform distance away from the center, the electric field has got to be radially outward, and it's got to have the same magnitude everywhere on that surface. And then it just follows the exact same type of reasoning. The electric field is uniform. It's always perpendicular to the surface. The dot product just gives us the magnitude of the field. We can bring the magnitude of the field, the uniform field, outside of the integral. And then the integral we're taking just happens to add up to be the surface area of the sphere. And so we find again that the magnitude of the field times 4 pi r squared is equal to the charge inside over epsilon 0. And so you get the exact same result. You look, get a result that looks like the charge of a, or the field of a point charge for a uniformly charged sphere. Okay. 
so that's where that comes from. Okay, we, we're using Gauss's law to show that in a more formal way that from the symmetry of the situation and from Gauss's law, it looks exactly the same as a point charge at the very center. Okay. Another proof we could do is what if we were looking at a situation where our Gaussian sphere was instead of being outside the uniformly charged sphere, what if it were inside? So this is, for example, a, uh, a, a ping pong ball, okay, a hollow plastic shell that has a uniform positive charge on it. And our Gaussian sphere happens to be just beneath the surface inside that ping pong ball. Well, let's apply Gauss's law. Again, E dot N hat dA is equal to Q inside over epsilon zero. How much charge is inside the Gaussian surface? None, right? Because all the charge is on the outer surface of the ping pong ball, and our mathematical surface happens to be below or inside this sphere. So there's no charge inside. That doesn't necessarily mean that the electric field is equal to zero, okay? Because we've seen cases where you might have a positive flux on one side and negative flux on the other and it sums up to zero, but there is electric field. But again, you go back to the symmetry of the situation. No matter what direction or, I, or what angle I look at this sphere, it's got to look the same. The only way to, for it to be the same on all sides and give me a flux is of zero is for the electric field to be equal to zero. So inside the sphere, no matter how big this Gaussian surface is, we can imagine shrinking it down or expanding it out to just below the surface, the electric field inside a uniformly charged uh, spherical shell due to that shell is equal to zero, okay? which is a result we knew from before, but now this is the more mathematical and elegant formal way of, of, uh, of proving it. Okay? So these types of proofs physicists like to use Gauss's law for. There is uh, another thing that we can think about that um, we dealt with in the past. which is the electric field inside a conductor. And we're dealing with the static equilibrium situation. So here is a metal, a piece of metal, and it can be any shape, I don't care. And it can even have some charge on the surface maybe even be polarized or something like that. And um, well, what we actually want to do is we actually want to prove, before I even write, draw those charges, we had said that charge, any excess charge on a conductor has to be on the surface. Okay, it can't, we can't have any excess charge in the interior. And we just kind of hand waved around that and said, well, if, if we had any excess charge, the mobile charges would move and charge would be on the surface. More formally, we could use Gauss's law and say that let's think about a Gaussian surface that basically follows the outline or follows the shape of our piece of metal. but we're sort of just shrinking it just below the surface of the metal. Okay, so we have a Gaussian surface that kind of just is sort of barely underneath the outer skin of the metal. Now, we do know something about the net electric field inside a metal. At static equilibrium, it's got to be equal to what? Zero, okay? We don't need Gauss's law for that. That comes from, where does it come from? When did we, this is, a, this is a review, when did we first talk about this? Where, what relationship did we use to, okay, the mobile electrons and the speed of the mobile electrons is related how to the electric field? U, U times E, right? U is what? Mobility, okay. 
So we have a metal with some mobility. If we're in static equilibrium, by definition, V is equal to what? Zero. Okay, so if V is equal to zero, the electric field has got to be equal to zero. That we already knew. Once you know the electric field is zero, well, what's the flux through the surface if the electric field is zero? Zero. So what's the charge inside? Zero. So there can't be any excess charge inside. And if you imagine, again, mapping that surface to just below the surface of the metal, the only possible place the charge can be is outside, out of that, outside of that surface. Okay. So there really isn't any mathematics involved in some sense. It's just knowing how the, the Gauss's law behaves and using this sort of geometric reasoning to figure this out. We could also use this to show something we haven't actually talked about before, which is this. What if you had a, uh, a piece of metal and there's a hole in it? And I'm, I'm drawing this in cross section, but what I really have here is a shell. So imagine like uh, just a, a silver hollow ball, okay, or just a shell of metal and, and the interior is hollow, okay. And so this is metal and this is just a hollow inside. And so the question is, okay, we can't, ha we, we can't have any charge in this region. We've already shown that. Um, can we have any charge on this surface. So can I have maybe some positive charge here? Is that possible? How would we show it? We want to use Gauss's law. So what's, what surface do I want to pick? The Gauss's surface where? Inside, inside here, or okay, inside the metal, right? We want it sort of the surface to be in the interior of the metal, but outside of the hollow hole inside the uh, inside the metal. And again, the electric field is equal to what in the metal? Got to be zero. So the electric flux has got to be. The field is zero. The flux has got to be zero also everywhere. And so the charge inside has got to be equal to zero. Okay. So we can't have any net charge on that inner surface. Now, that still doesn't get us the whole way through, though, because you could have maybe some negative here and some positive here. And so the interior is polarized, and this charge, negative charge, exactly cancels out this positive charge. That would satisfy Q inside being equal to zero. So Gauss's law can't tell us whether that's a possibility or not. But there is another principle we can use to figure this out. Any ideas? We've seen it before. If, if this were possible, what would I have inside this hollow cavity? I'd have a dipole, and so if, I, if there's a dipole, there's got to be what? If I, I could measure electric field, and the electric field would be pointing what direction? Positive or negative. Okay, so there's an electric field in here. Electric field is equal to zero out here. Does that cause a problem? What about potential difference? If I go from here to here in the direction of the electric field, the potential difference is going to be what? It's going to decrease. So I get a net uh, delta V that is negative, right? Well, is that the only path I could choose? No. What other path could I choose? Through the metal. What if I choose a path through the metal? That delta V has got to be what? Zero. Is there a problem here? 
it doesn't cancel out, right? The round trip potential difference has got to be what? Zero. And so if I go through the, the metal here and get a zero potential difference, I better go through here and get a zero potential difference. So combining Gauss's law with delta V round trip equal to zero tells us a hollow cavity inside a metal at static equilibrium actually can't have any charge on it. The only charge can only can be on the outer surface, not on the inner surface. Okay? Even if it's polarized, still get a zero charge on the inner cavity. Okay? Which is kind of useful, because here's a question. You're in a car <laughs> when a thunderstorm approaches. You see a lightning strike nearby. What should you do? Hundred percent say stay in the car, all right. First time ever. First time ever. Now, based on this, can you answer why you should stay in the car? Because you're in an enclosed metal box and inside here there's gonna be no no net charge and therefore the electric field inside here is gonna be equal to zero. Yeah. You actually have and a, a metal frame of a car isn't completely enclosed, right? But it's actually close enough. It's actually close enough. Between the roof and the, and the supports, the frame underneath, you, you don't, it, it, almost, it almost obeys this law even if you have like a cage or uh, something that seems open and it isn't a completely closed surface. If you can get close enough to a kind of a closed cage, then you've essentially made, sometimes it's called a Faraday cage, a, a, a metal box where the net electric field, even if there's charge on the outside, okay, or a lightning strike, uh, you're staying relatively safe. It's not due to the rubber tires insulating you or anything like that. It's just, it's basically due to the metal frame of the, uh, of 